Hi everyone, greetings again from Ganubi. We're in the middle of lockdown here in South Africa, but I trust you're still feeling encouraged, and that's because you've got your eyes firmly fixed on Jesus. Well, I can't wait to share God's word with you today, and so if you've got a Bible available, let's turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 63. And again, I pray that God's word will be a source of great hope and blessing and encouragement to all of us today. So let's read from verse 1 of Psalm 63, a psalm written by David. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Father, we thank you again today so much for the resource of your word. Lord, thank you. This is no ordinary book. This is the Word of God, each word inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, today, won't you cause this Word to come alive in our hearts, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and, Lord, more than anything else, give us the courage to respond in obedience to your Word today. We pray it in Jesus' great name. Amen. Well, as always, I like to give you a little bit of background and context to the verses. And so what had happened was, as I mentioned, a psalm written by David. He was king of Israel. And he experienced this personal um, devastation, this personal crisis of having his son Absalom um, turn against him. And not only turn against him, but go on a mission to take his life and to murder him. Now, just for a moment... Uh, put yourself in David's shoes. You're a parent, maybe a, a father watching today. And your son, a son you've raised, a son you've loved, number one, turns their back on you. And number two, goes on a mission to take your life and to murder you. And so it's from this context, from this personal place of, of pain and hardship, David flees to the wilderness. He flees for his life and he writes these incredibly encouraging words. Now, just a question off the bat to get us going today. Um, generally speaking, what is your first response to the hardships and challenges of life? In other words, when these hard, difficult seasons of life present themselves, what is your modus operandi? Where do you go? And to whom do you turn? Well, maybe it's to one of the usual suspects, maybe alcohol, maybe drugs, or maybe you play the blame game. Blame somebody else for your predicament, or even blame God. Uh, why has this happened to me? Well, what I love about David's response is in the middle of this season of real personal pain and personal devastation, he doesn't blame anybody else. He doesn't turn to anything else. His immediate response is declaration of faith. Oh God, you are my God. Clearly, David's not running from God or turning from God. In fact, he's running to God. And he recognizes God is his source. God is his rock. And it's a personal declaration of faith. Oh God, you are my God. Now, maybe like me, you've experienced the privilege of growing up in a home where mom and dad and maybe granny and grandpa loved and followed Jesus. You've been given a wonderful heritage, so to speak, of Christian living. But I think you know this morning that you can never inherit somebody else's faith. Praise God for mom's faith. Praise God for dad's faith and for the heritage you've received. But like David, you've got to come to a point in your life where their faith becomes your faith. And you can say with confidence, Oh God, you are my God. I don't know about you, but I just love the book of Isaiah and especially the, um, chapter 6 where Isaiah, who's a young man, um, writes these incredible words. And 
Uh, I would encourage you to read the whole of chapter 6, but just to get you going, to whet your appetite, he says in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, listen to the personal pronouns now in this verse, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he goes on to say, My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So for Isaiah, he could narrow down this personal encounter to a specific year. In the year that King Uzziah died, a specific time, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Um, as with David, just these words of personal faith, these words of personal experience and personal encounter. Again, I love the conversation in Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus has with his disciples. And um, it goes something like this. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came to the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, So who do men say that the Son of Man is? They replied, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And here comes the critical question. But what about you, Jesus says? Who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter, true to form, takes the bulls by the horn. Uh, and he says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. A personal declaration of faith. So friends, can you see the common denominator beginning to emerge? You've got David. You've got Isaiah. You've got Peter, these are personal declarations of faith. Not somebody else's God, not a God in a general sense of the word, but God, you have become my God. I recognize you, Jesus, to be the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I tell you what, that declaration of personal faith becomes um, a solid rock beneath your feet. In a, in a world of changing circumstances, that personal faith is an anchor for your soul. Oh God, you are my God. On the mountains and in the valleys of life, you are my rock. You are my anchor. You are my God. But then David goes on uh, in verse 1. And look at the words he uses. Just incredibly beautiful words. He says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. Now, obviously, being in the wilderness and being in the desert, there would have been this physical thirst that David would have experienced. And maybe you can remember a time, I certainly can, where I've been desperately thirsty, and uh, you just can't wait to drink some water to quench your thirst. And so David, of course, being in the wilderness, he's got that obvious natural thirst, but that doesn't even come close to comparing the spiritual thirst that is so obvious in David's life. He says, I thirst for you, God. My whole being is thirsty for you. And this is not a once-off statement he makes. For example, in Psalm um, 42 verse 1, he says, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you, O God. So my soul thirsts for you, for the living God. Again, these words of of insatiable desire, a deep appetite for God and for the things of God. I love what he says in verse 8, later on in this psalm we've been reading, Psalm 63, he says, My soul follows hard after you. Again, just these words of real desperation and desire for the things of God, and in fact for the presence of God itself. Friends, you know what the Bible says, that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Um, Galatians 6 verse 8, God, re God rewards those who are hungry and thirsty for himself, not the casual inquirer, but those who, are, who have got an earnest desire for the things of God. God rewards those kinds of people. And I found that that kind of hunger and thirst for God is actually contagious. It's, it's difficult to contain that to one person. It spreads from person to person. Um, I remember some years ago spending a week or two on, on regular occasions in the middle of rural areas in our province, living with the local people and praying for the sick and sharing the love of Jesus with the local people. And of course, we stayed in the huts with the local African people. And I enjoyed um, developing a friendship with a local pastor called Wilberforce. And Wilberforce and I shared a hut together. And 
Uh, I'll never forget just this real raw passion and desire in Wilberforce's life for the things of God. Now keep in mind, from a material perspective, he was poor. Um, he had nothing uh, to boast about in terms of material possessions. But boy, this man was rich in spirit. And I remember waking up in the mornings as the sun was rising, the crack of dawn, and the first thing Wilberforce would do before he even breathed, it seemed, was to get into his knees and to lift his hands to heaven and to connect with God, to worship God, to honor God, to draw from God. And just again, this expression of a real desperation um, for the things of God. And I learned from that. It really had a massive impact upon my life. And I think over this lockdown period, when life has taken a different turn, it presents a wonderful opportunity for us to spend more time investing in the presence of God, more time investing in the Word of God, and developing this, this insatiable desire um, and desperation for the things of God. And keep in mind, God rewards those who diligently seek Him. You will never, ever be the loser for making God the number one priority in your life. But then, of course, David goes on in the psalm in verse 3 to make this incredible statement. He says, referring to God, your loving kindness is better than life. Now, just take a moment and think about the power of those words. God, your loving kindness is better than the very best life can offer me. Now, try and contextualize that for yourself. God, your loving kindness, to be loved by you, is better than fill in the blank. Better than surfing. Better than fishing. Better than relationships. Better than money. Better than success. All those things are great in their own way. But God, nothing compares. Nothing comes close to comparing to the fact that I'm loved by you. Your loving kindness is better than life itself. And then look at verse 5. David goes on to say this. He says, My soul will be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, as with the richest of foods. Now, think about when you're enjoying um, a delicious mutton stew or beef stew, or even better, mutton or beef poiki. And you may be lucky enough to get that part of the poiki where you got that marrow. And inside the marrow, there's that succulent, juicy piece of meat. And uh, to get that meat out the marrow, you've got to suck it. And just that explosion of taste and flavor, and you enjoy that so much. But at least I do. I'm sure somebody else can relate to that as well. But, but what David's saying is to be known by God, to be loved by God, to walk in relationship with, uh, with God. Man, that is the anchor for my life. That is better than anything else you could ever experience. Nothing compares to that. Now, friends, uh, it's interesting if we consider those words because we're living, at least in the Western world, um, in a culture where we have so much materially. And yet there's so many people in our day and age who are restless, who are dissatisfied, who are anxious, and who aren't living in a place of peace. And maybe it's because we've been drawing our satisfaction or looking for contentment in the wrong, pla in the wrong places. Uh, drawing from the wrong sources, so to speak. And maybe what David's reminding us of today is that there's only one who can truly satisfy the deepest longings of our souls. And that is Jesus. And again, this period of lockdown provides such an opportunity for you to sit at the feet of Jesus and to draw from his resources and to allow him to fill you with those rivers of living water that can satisfy the deepest longings of your souls. So let's pick up um, the psalm again and let's turn to verse 9 and to read a few verses from there together as David continues. He says, those who want to kill me will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. Now, David here is speaking about God as his vindicator. Um, he's expressing his faith in God's ability to exercise justice on his behalf. I'm being hunted down. I'm on the run. Um, I'm in the wilderness. 
things are tough. Uh, I'm being falsely accused. But God, I trust you to fight on my behalf. I trust you to be my vindicator. Now, again, um, have you ever been on the receiving end of injustice? Have you ever been on the receiving end of unfair criticism where someone's hurt you or wronged you or falsely accused you? If not, what planet have you been living on? <laughs> because all of us from time to time experience the hurt and the pain that comes from injustice or criticism or being falsely accused. The real question is, when that happens to us, how do we respond? Do we want to get even? Do we want to make them pay? Do we want to give them a piece of our mind? Or can we, like David, say, God, you are my vindicator. And I trust the outcome of this situation to you. I trust you to bring about justice. And you know what, friends? God will vindicate you. Maybe not in this life, but certainly he will vindicate you in the life to come. In the short term, yes, people may hurt you. Uh, people may speak against you. People may falsely accuse you. In the short term, they may win. But in the long term, just rest assured, God will be your vindicator. They will not win in the end because God always wins. We've just had Easter weekend here in South Africa and uh, in, around the world. And on the Friday, you'll remember that Jesus was the one who was falsely accused. Jesus was the one who was ridiculed and mocked and spat upon and cursed. And Jesus was the one who had that crown of thorns thrust upon his brow and had those, those nails driven through his hands and his feet in a public humiliating execution. And it seemed on the Friday that evil had triumphed. That evil had triumphed over good. But of course, on Sunday with the resurrection, God vindicated Jesus by raising him from the dead. And today we know that Jesus Christ reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and He is coming back. And so I want to encourage you, um, don't look to get even, don't lose your peace like David, trust your vindication to the Lord. But now, David ends the psalm with this incredible, incredible verse, verse 11. Have a careful look at it, please. He says in verse 11, but the king, referring to himself, will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will glory in him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. I mean, those are interesting words because circumstantially, nothing had changed for David. He was still in the wilderness. He had still been um, turned upon, turned against uh, by his own son. He was still being hunted and his life was in danger. And yet in the middle of that extraordinarily difficult personal valley, in the middle of that personal storm, it must have been devastating for David. He says, you know what? I will rejoice in the Lord. What a statement to make. Friends, I want to encourage you. Don't allow life circumstances to shrink your view of God. Don't allow life circumstances, especially the hard roads of life, to diminish your confidence in God. Like David, I encourage you, lift up your eyes and make the declaration of faith. I will rejoice in God. I love 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10 where Paul, the Apostle Paul, unpacks his personal pedigree of hardship and suffering. But he also says this. He says, having nothing and yet possessing everything. Just take a moment to consider those words. Having nothing from a worldly perspective, yet possessing everything. Friends, you may be materially on the back foot. You may be on the receiving end of injustice. You may be experiencing a hard, dark season of life. But I want to tell you today, if you have Jesus Christ in your life, if you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you have everything worth having. From a spiritual perspective, you are multi, multi-millionaire because Jesus Christ is the pearl of great price. Jesus Christ is the ultimate treasure. If you have Jesus... You have everything worth having. And like Paul, you can say, man, I'll tell you what. Um, 
having nothing from a material perspective, yet I possess everything. Why? Because I have the treasure of Jesus Christ. So let me encourage you, in the face of this pandemic and in the face of whatever personal challenge you may be facing, I encourage you, echo the words of David. I will rejoice in the Lord. He is my joy. He is the source of my satisfaction. He is my treasure. In Him, I lack nothing. So friends, as we wrap it up, let me just leave you with those, with those final thoughts and thoughts to consider, maybe pray through. Can you, like David, confidently say today that no matter your circumstances, be they good or be they challenging, you can say those words of personal faith and personal conviction, O oh God, you are my God, my Lord, my Savior, an anchor for my soul. Number two, are you hungry? Are you thirsty for God? Have you got this insatiable desire, this raw desperation for the things of God? Because remember, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Maybe you want to use this time of lockdown to draw from the wells of scripture to sink your roots deeply into Jesus and to draw from the rivers of living water this insatiable desperation for the things of God. What about number three? When people hurt you, as they will from time to time, when people unfairly oppose you or criticize you, can you be at peace and trust your vindication to God? And then number four, will you, like David, no matter your circumstances today, Declare with these words of faith, I will rejoice in the Lord. I, I may lack certain things in life, but in Jesus I lack nothing. And my hope and my faith and my trust and my confidence is in Him. Jesus is enough for me. Let us pray. Father, thank you. We ask you to Use these words to encourage us and challenge us. And Father, I believe that's exactly what you have done. And so, Lord, I pray for each person who's watching, each person who's listening. Lord, I pray that they use this lockdown period to um, draw close to you, to diligently seek you, Father, to draw from the rivers of living water. Um, Lord, that they may make those declarations of faith that, God, you are my God, and Regardless of what life may throw across my path, I will rejoice in the Lord. I trust my vindication to God. I will not lose my peace over injustice and over criticism, but I will find my joy and my hope and my satisfaction in Jesus. He is enough for me. Amen. Friends, may God bless you. I hope that encouraged you. And I can't wait to share another word with you. Same time. Same place next week. Amen. God bless you.